Take it away. Thank you. Uh, thanks for inviting me to come join you all today. I didn't think I'd be speaking to a room full of nutritionists in my uh, early career here, so it's a little intimidating. So I do want to clarify that I'm not one. And uh, I am a reproductive physiologist looking at some uh, feed additives for mitigating the heat stress in boars and sows. Um, so if you have a lot of nutrition questions, I'm probably going to defer them to the front row here uh, because I probably can't answer all of them very well And if you get too mechanistic on me and your nutrition knowledge. Um, but again, I'm here at Purdue uh, just a couple years in and starting to look at uh, this betaine product uh, as a means for mitigating heat stress. So I thought I'd talk a little bit about uh, the impacts of heat stress to the swine industry. Um, those of you who have been at some of the recent Midwest Animal Science meetings and things have probably seen some of these numbers presented through uh, any of the grants coming out of the pork board in the past few years. But um, the recent publication, or not very recent, 10-year-old publication claimed that it was about $350 million per year impact to the swine industry. Uh, I think we probably know it's a little bit more than that. Um, and one way to indicate that is Dr. Steve Pullman's comment that it is double the impact of PERS uh, to the industry. So we have to, even in Indiana, where coming from North Carolina to back to Indiana, I have an appreciation for, I don't find Indiana summers quite as bad as I did as a child after living in North Carolina for nine years, but 25% of the year, we're still dealing with ambient temperatures um, that will impact the animals. Most of these impacts are production impacts, so decreases in milk production, body weight loss. Uh, in the sows, we're looking at an increase in wean to estrus intervals. Uh, uh, impaired embryo development, and in the boars, we see a reduction in semen quality and uh, concentration. So the impacts really are um, a little bit larger than just during the hot months. So some of these production measures actually kind of carry on into uh, later than just the summer months. So the impacts of the heat uh, kind of last a few more months than when they're just during the actual summer. Uh, so what is kind of the physiology of heat stress? Um, so the animal sees an elevation in body temperature and an increase in reproduct or <laughs> respiratory rate. Um, and then the blood flow shunts away from the um, core to the extremities to try to dissipate some of that heat. Uh, so in that process, then, we get some interesting effects at the level of the gut. Uh, so a decrease in oxygen and then depletion of ATP in the level of the gut. And it's always you know, commonly called the leaky gut syndrome. So this is when we start to see LPS go up in the blood and some effects there from basically a decrease of nutrient absorption then at the level of the gut. Um, so with that, we then see a decrease in feed intake weight loss, and then milk production will go down with a decrease in feed intake, and then we'll start to see impairments in embryo development and oocyte quality, and in the boar, we'll start to see a reduction in that semen output and quality at that point. I should note that it doesn't have to be a severe heat stress to get some of these effects happening. So um, mild heat stress over a longer period of time will create the same physiological state. Um, so it doesn't have to be a severe, you know, all of a sudden the barn temperature jumps up to 90 degrees for a week. It can be um, a relatively mild heat stress that is basically equivalent to the summer in the Midwest. So what is betaine? Most of you probably know better than I do uh, about the details of betaine. But it is a naturally occurring methylamine uh, that's currently available as a feed additive. And it can have a couple different functions. So it's a relatively small molecule if I'm commenting as an organic chemist. Uh, but it can function as an osmolite. So it can help to minimize cellular water loss and reduces energy expenditure for ion pumping, especially at the level of the gut. So when we talked about heat stress physiology uh, kind of depleting energy at the level of the gut, we think that betaine may be able to spare a little bit of that energy in the gut. So overall, uh, some work that was done I think in the 80s and 90s in nursery and grow finish pigs kind of showed that it improved digestibility of nutrients uh, when added to the diet. 
It can also function as a methyl donor. So um, it is basically right here in this pathway. Again, it can be, it's naturally occurring, so it's made from choline and actually converts homocysteine into methionine in the methionine pathway. So it enhances methionine availability and will ultimately be able to reduce homocysteine levels by converting homocysteine into methionine. So a little bit about this homocysteine. Um, why would reducing homocysteine be maybe important? Uh, there's some interesting data out there in other species besides the pig. Um, one nice paper in the New England Journal of Medicine looked at uh, some men coming in to fertility treatments and they found that 18% of the men coming in seeking fertility treatments actually had a mutation in the blah, 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 MTHFR. <laughs> That's, see, you're a nutritionist. You probably already cite these enzymes off all the time. That's not in my wheelhouse. Um, but at the end of the day, what that comes down to is I think that is actually part of the folate cycle um, and attaches or has a common enzyme with the methionine cycle. I'm getting better at this. Um, but what happens in these men is they have a reduction in folate and a very high level of homocysteine in their bloodstream. Uh, if they look at knockout mice for the MTHFR, um, they also see that they have basically the males are infertile and they don't produce any sperm. So there is some sort of a tie-in somewhere between either a reduction in folate or a high level of homocysteine that is correlated with infertility in males. Um, and then the other interesting piece is that in Japanese quail, homocysteine has been shown to increase during times of heat stress. So I'm making a little bit of a case that perhaps betaine supplementation to reduce homocysteine levels during heat stress uh, might help to prevent or mitigate some of those negative impacts on semen quality. Um, so I have focused on the male. I'm going to do a little bit of a review of the female side as well. Um, so there have been several studies that had come out in the kind of early and mid-2000s here that looked at betaine supplementation to sows. And uh, they have a couple that were fed feeding betaine during lactation versus gestation to sows. And this was somewhere between seven and nine grams per day uh, of betaine supplementation. And if we look over here, betaine versus controls, um, they did have a significant reduction in feed intake with the betaine supplementation, but they did also have a 0.8 piglet uh, number born alive, pig born alive in the next litter. So those of us who know anything about that, that's a pretty good jump. Um, the other thing that was nice was the wean to estrus interval was reduced by an entire day. So that's some pretty good data for feeding um, betaine during lactation. Uh, another couple studies here was, or at least one really good one here in 2012 was looking at feeding betaine during gestation. And this one had a parity effect. So the benefits of feeding betaine during gestation were really only evident in the higher parity sows. So it's the two green bars over here um, looking at betaine in parities three to seven um, on the uh, subsequent litter number born alive. So these are litter sizes greater than 15 um, was higher when the betaine was supplemented during gestation in higher parity sows. So more recently, um, a study is coming out of NC State uh, looking at betaine supplementation to sows in a large uh, commercial operation in the United States. And this is, they were feeding betaine during a couple different phases of production. Um, so they were feeding betaine basically during lactation or lactation until 35 days post breeding. So a couple different phases there. Um, and they're seeing fairly similar results. Um, they do see some age effects as well. So when betaine was actually fed from weaning until 30 days post AI without feeding it during lactation, the young parity sows had an increase in the wean to estrus interval and an increase in number born alive. So the young parity sows seemed to benefit from the betaine being fed after lactation. 
However, all of the sows, young and old, received benefit from feeding back to betaine during lactation. So they had an increase in the number of pigs born alive in the subsequent litter, uh, looking at the numbers here, which was almost a little more than a pig there, uh, born alive in the next litter. Uh, so just to follow up on that, we are currently working on a couple different projects to keep going on the effects of betaine in the sow. Um, so some collaborators are, I think, looking at betaine supplementation not during the summer. So I should have reiterated that the NC State study was done during the summer. Um, so looking at the effects of betaine supplementation when there is not a heat stress. Um, at Purdue, we are looking specifically at supplementing, supplementing the sows during a controlled heat stress and looking at its direct effects on follicular development in the ovary. So we're going to be mapping those sows' ovaries from a couple days before weaning until they ovulate to see if some of those number born alive effects mechanistically are the betaine somehow improving their follicular development post weaning. Um, so to move on to the boar. Uh, last summer, in the summer of 2014, uh, we had about 89 boars on trial in Oklahoma looking at, again, betaine supplementation during the heat. So the um, diets were designed to be fairly similar, at least the uh, low percentage here was designed to be similar on a grams per day of what was being fed to the sows, even though boars are limit fed. So we fed uh, three diets, either no betaine, or we top dressed the boars with either 0.3%, which turned out to be about eight grams per day, or we went ahead and doubled it, <laughs> just to see what happens, at 16 grams per day, um, because the boars are limit fed and fed a smaller amount of feed. We had two genetic lines uh, in this study, so one was a terminal cross and one was a maternal cross. And I think this might be kind of like the omen of a new faculty member's first study, is that I think that might have been the coolest summer on record in Oklahoma since 1920-something. Um, so I did throw up here um, some of the maximum and minimum temperatures in the barn uh, during the summer that we were doing this project. And uh, if you look here, this is 25 degrees C and this is 30 degrees C. So I wouldn't exactly call that the most serious heat stress that the boars were under by any means. Um, but we did get some interesting data, even though they really weren't under a severe heat stress or even a moderate heat stress. So some of the things we looked at in this project was uh, that plasma homocysteine level. So something interesting is there, I don't have any known data in pigs about whether heat stress increases homocysteine in the blood. but it did in those quails, and we saw that same thing here. So in the controls, we took a blood sample uh, right when we started the project, a midsummer and a late summer blood sample, and we did see homocysteine concentrations go up as the temperatures did go up to average June, July, August temperatures. Uh, and both of the betaine supplemented treatment groups had a significant reduction in the plasma homocysteine concentrations compared to the controls. Um, so betaine was functioning in what I thought was a mechanism for it and reducing homocysteine in, in that methionine pathway. Another little interesting thing that we looked at, I mean, betaine is naturally occurring in the body, but I didn't know how much was naturally in semen. Uh, so we did quantify betaine and semen in all of the treatment groups, just a subset of the bores from each treatment group, again, early, mid, and late during that time frame. So betaine is present in some seminal plasma naturally at fairly low levels. And by feeding betaine, we actually increased the amount of betaine in the seminal plasma 59 and 54 percent in the two treatments. So those weren't different from each other, but taken together, betaine supplementation in the feed did increase the amount of betaine present in the seminal plasma. I don't necessarily know what that means, but <laughs> if it functions as an osmolite, it could be having some direct effects on sperm cells, and um, we would need to kind of do some more investigations. This was just kind of an initial step to seeing if it's actually present in the semen. So um, 
What was the neat finding here is even though the bores really weren't under a severe street heat stress, we had a p-value of about 0.1, so a tendency for the concentration of sperm in the ejaculates to go up with the betaine supplementation. So if you look down here on the bottom, the total sperm production in the ejaculates uh, was about 80 billion in the controls and 85 and 90 in the two betaine treated groups. So I think that's a pretty uh, promising effect there that betaine even not really under a heat stress was able to improve sperm concentration in the ejaculate. And so if you assume that there's um, at least to one and a half to three billion cells per AI doses. This means every single ejaculate here uh, in the betaine supplementation would be at least an additional one to two to three uh, doses of semen produced in every ejaculate from the betaine supplemented groups. The semen was shipped from Oklahoma overnight to our lab at Purdue where we did some more intensive semen quality estimates. Um, so those of you who have worked with computer-assisted semen evaluation systems. Um, we used a CASA to basically look at all of the mobility of each individual sperm cell in the semen samples, or a representation of those sperm cells in the semen sample to see if they swam in any different way. So the fun thing us reproductive people get to do is actually track sperm and see how they swim. And <laughs> <laughs> And so um, there were no differences in the betaine supplementation and the controls in any of those measures of, of mobility of the sperm cells. We also did a flow cytometry stain, the cyber and PI, to do basically a membrane integrity live dead assay. And we didn't see any differences between the treatment groups and the percentage of cells that were live and dead. So here's looking a little bit at the uh, actual mo morphology or semen quality estimate on morphology. Um, so we had no differences in the overall morphology. So those of you who don't look at sperm very often, this would be a completely normal looking sperm cell. And we didn't see any differences between the treatments in the percentage of normal sperm. We also did an acrosome morphology, which was just a visual assessment of the acrosome on a representative population of cells. And we didn't see any differences in the acrosome between the different treatment groups. The one area that we did have a, a statistical difference in was actually the percentage of DMRs, which is distal mid-piece reflexes. So I have pictures for you here in case you're not semen people. Um, but this would be a sperm cell here that has the tail basically kind of wrapping around at a mid-piece and coming back up towards the head. These are not modal cells and they are not fertile cells, so they are not able to fertilize the egg. Um, these are common in situations where osmolarity changes happen in the epididymis um, or as a result of some sort of another insult in the laboratory. Uh, so when I broke this down by genetic line, we had a genetic line by treatment interaction for the presence of these DMRs. And so it was actually um, only increased in the high betaine supplemented group and only in the maternal line of the bores that seemed to have this change come about from the high level of betaine supplementation. So again, a few additional studies that we're working on. Um, I kind of talked about the sows already. We have another sow project going on in, uh, in Chile uh, in co uh, collaboration with AgriSuper, and that is uh, doing just some more repeating of the uh, betaine supplementation during lactation to, um, in a large production system of 150,000 sows in Chile. Uh, that should be wrapping up here pretty soon, so we should have some data there. Uh, again, I talked about the small sow project with a controlled heat stress and looking at the follicular dynamics and homocysteine uh, in the sows when fed during lactation. Um, and then again, this coming summer, we'll be doing some more bore work with betaine in a more controlled heat stress as well. So we'll perform this one at Purdue and make sure we get everybody the same level of heat stress. Um, and we're also going to continue the supplementation of the betaine beyond the heat stress in those bores and see if there is a, a, an ongoing benefit besides just during the summer. And that is what I have for you on betaine today.